I'm always quite curious in these events who, who, you're, who you're competing against in terms of the other panels. And in fact, you know, if you look at the other panels, they, there's a qualitative difference actually to this panel in the sense those are the, the kind of, uh, I don't know how to put this, those are the kind of, uh, you know, kind of high attention uh, sexy crises in the sense of refugees, climate, um, uh, economic crisis. And actually, this, this, this panel is more of a kind of slow-burning crisis that will eventually re reach a peak, but actually might underlie a lot, a lot of the issues. We certainly have a substantial interaction, certainly with the refugee crisis, um, but also uh, with climate change uh, and with economic crisis too, of course, when we're talking about jobs. So my presentation gives a, an overview of um, uh, my, well, Tony and myself's take on uh, the issues around employment, um, the interaction of inclusive growth and structural change. Uh, and they raise some question marks about what aid might be able to do about that and some views on that. And actually, in, in a sense, I've, I've focused here on ODA, but you could think about, well, what could development cooperation more broadly, not just ODA, but, you know, tr you know favourable trade policies, uh, dare I even say it's, you know, the, uh, migration and, and uh, other forms of uh, international cooperation. So the presentation itself is, is premised on five... Uh, five arguments. The first is that there's, there's essentially, I think, three curves that help us understand uh, what I'll call the jobs crisis. You could equally well call it the, the, the jobs opportunity, uh, particularly if, uh, if, uh, there's no, if productive employment does emerge uh, for those looking for work. Uh, so perhaps there's an opportunity as well, but I think there's also a, a crisis to it in the sense of the, the, the numbers and what's required in a, a relatively short space of time. The second contention uh, relates to what I see, or what we see as the kind of, essentially the underlying tension between two development goals that developing countries are pursuing. The first is structural change, by which I mean the shift to a, a higher economic productivity, uh, different sectors or intra uh, or intersectoral uh, allocation of, reallocation of economic activity and inclusive growth. Then I'll talk a little bit about differences between the regions. If, you, if you're looking at sub-Saharan Africa, you'll get quite a different sense of the crisis compared to, to other parts of the world. If you look at the, if you look as we will in a moment at the demographic curves, you'll probably start to panic. Um, certainly the, the, the number of people who'll be looking for jobs in sub-Saharan Africa is, is on the rise and will be perhaps in the order of 100 million uh, for a year for, for a new entrance to the labor force. Uh, so that's going to be a substantial number of people looking for work. Um, I'll say a bit about structural change. We tend to look at structural change as conceptually different to inclusive growth. What I'm arguing is by looking at the tensions between the two and some of the trade-offs, that might be a productive route to go down. And finally, uh, when it comes to aid, I think there's things that aid can do that national funds can't, and that might be an interesting avenue to pursue when it comes to employment. So first of all, the three curves. Now, um, so each, each picture represents a curve, and this is, this is not a test. Uh, you, most of you, I think, will know Arthur Lewis, who's in the top right-hand corner, very famous development economist. Uh, this is an anonymous baby from Google. Um, and then the bottom, there's, there's people with placards uh, uh, looking for jobs. So essentially, we're talking about three curves, I think. The first is the demographic curve, which is actually a set of curves. So there's dependency ratio, working age population, but importantly, I think the labour force annual growth, the absolute number of people that, that are looking for jobs each year. Uh, and so for some parts of the world, it's too many. So for some parts of the world, we'll see it's actually too few, perhaps. Then there's a, a structural change curve, which is essentially about the, the shares of GDP and employment and how they're split sectorally. Now, there's been some debate about deindustrialization or premature deindustrialization in developing countries. And what's the potential for the service sector to actually provide employment in the future? And then the third curve is, is, is about job creation and how it uh, relates to, to uh, uh, GDP and value added. So I think there's a tension here between, uh, and, and again, this is not a test. I'm curious if anyone recognizes these people. On oh, the left-hand side is Simon Kuznets, very famous for the, the Kuznets curve. Uh, the, the one on the, the right is probably less well known. He's um, uh, Corrado Gini, who developed the Gini coefficient. So actually, I think developing countries are pursuing two goals that create a tension, uh, or at least a set of trade-offs. The first goal is, is structural change. That's economic development, the transition from an agrarian, traditional subsistence economy 
uh, into a high productivity uh, modern economy. Uh, and the second is around inclusive growth, ensuring that the benefits of growth are broad based. This is a historical debate that re-emerged in the World Bank's shared prosperity thinking, but also it's essentially about pro-poor growth and participation in the growth process through employment. Now, one of those uh, goals tends to push up inequality. If you look at the, although the, the Kuznets curve is, is uh, uh, largely dumped as a universal law, if you look at the time series data for the countries that have been growing fast and that growth has been led by structural change, you tend to find decile shares of the richest uh, expanding and of the poorest uh, being squeezed. Uh, on the other hand, inclusive growth is best achieved with static or falling inequality. So at the center of these is, a, a, is a, an issue around the dynamics of inequality that I think plays out through employment. And how does this differ by regions? So I think you can ask three questions. The first is how many jobs are needed and how does this differ by region? The second is you know, which sectors and you know, whether you talk about dig it, make it or sell it. And then think about how many jobs are actually being created and how that differs between regions. And also the trade-offs between employment creation and productivity, productivity growth. So these are, the, these are effectively what the panel is about in many ways. These are the demography graphs for regions of the world uh, from 1950 to 20, uh, 20, 2100. You know, of course, the, the, the projections are, 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 are medium variant here. Um, if you take them at face value, you, as I say, you'd probably start worrying for some regions of the world, or at least you'd see a, you know, the, the, the crisis in other rooms may appear more acute and sexy, but actually the underlying crisis here is really quite significant. Um, I draw your attention to the graph on the right-hand side, which I think is, in some ways is perhaps the more important graph. And what it shows is for the regions of the world, uh, how the, 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 the numbers of the working age population is changing. The blue shaded uh, line is uh, between now and, and 2030. And as you can see, for sub-Saharan Africa, you have this, this kind of a very sharply rising curve, um, uh, over 100 million new entrants to the labor force every year, uh, uh, perhaps for the next 70 years, if you accept the medium variant projections. Uh, in other parts of the world, particularly in East Asia, what you have is almost the opposite, in the sense say, in China because of the one-child policy, but also Indonesia, Malaysia. Over the next 10 years, other parts of East Asia will actually go to the situation where the labor force is, is contracting. And that, of course, raises issues for you know, how, how that, that's paid for and the kind of employment for those who are in the labor force and what they, they essentially will be taxed for. Uh, India has a, a declining curve, but it's still at the level of, of, of 100 million uh, labor force entrants each year. In, in South Asia. Then there's been a lot of debate recently about the, the, the issues of industrialization, deindustrialization. In many developing countries, there's now a debate about reindustrialization. And so, of course, there's the, you know, the, the, the Arthur Lewis, uh, Simon Kuznets, and others historically talked about the structural transformation from a traditional society or traditional economy to a modern economy. Again, drawing your attention to the, 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 the the, the curves on the right-hand side of manufacturing in particular, the, the regions of the world are labelled by their initials, EAs, East, Af uh, East Asia, uh, SSA is Sub-Saharan Africa, VAs, value added, and EMPs, employment. And what you tend to find is it, it appears that the, the share of manufacturing in GDP or employment has reached some kind of peak. Uh, and it's actually services that are on the rise now. Within those patterns, there's all sorts of oddities, particularly for Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, if you look... So, for example, manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa is actually almost going around in a circle there. Uh, and I think some of that relates to the, the impacts on manufacturing uh, of, of commodity booms, perhaps. And finally, the, 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 essentially, the, the, how many jobs are being created per unit of value added. So this shows how things differ regionally in terms of sectors and parts of the world. Um, this is the relationship between GDP, or value added, and employment created. So the, the dotted line up the middle at 45 degrees is essentially one to one, okay? Uh, a, 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 as a relationship between job creation and employment. If, 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 a, if a country's red curve is above the curve, uh, then it's on the, the, the favoring productivity side. Below the curve is favoring employment. Um, I think what's interesting when you, when you look across these curves is um, actually in some parts of the world, you, you can see that uh, there's, there's not only a, uh, a trending uh, that's not that far from the one-to-one -one line, 
and other parts of the curve, the, 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 the line of best fit is substantial distance from the one-to-one -one curve. And this is, I mean, to me, this raises some of the trade-offs in some of this the debate about employment um, that I'll come to in a moment. <clears throat> so I think that there's been, a, obviously, there's, there's a historic literature on inclusive growth and structural change. And one way to try and think about the interaction of the two around employment that might be useful is trying to think, well, if you were going to have inclusive structural change, what would that look like? Clearly, you could have a focus on the workers with less education or lower education levels. You could have a focus on SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. You might think about the employment to GDP ratios. You might think about the trade-offs between productivity-led growth and labor absorption, particularly at certain levels of development. You might think about the composition of the informal and the formal sector. But each of these has a kind of, a kind of trade-off or a caveat. So if you were thinking about <clears throat> the, the employment to GDP ratios, you might want to think also about the productivity gains issue and what's driving growth. If you were thinking about the composition of employment, you may favor formal employment, but that actually may be less jobs. All of these things seem to raise sort of normative questions about uh, the kind of, uh, kind of jobs that might be created and the trade-offs. And also then it sort of follows on a set of trade-offs about who's supposed to do what about it. So again, and kind of crudely in a way, the, um, the quickest thing to do would be simply to put more capital or, 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 or expand state-owned enterprises. But of course that raises issues of the sustainability of that, financial sustainability, and also the levels of productivity. <clears throat> you might want to liberalize the SME sector or the climate or support SMEs, but then that would create a lot of informal low productivity jobs potentially. You might want to think about foreign investment, but that tends to favor skilled workers. So that may not deal with this sort of inclusivity type arguments. Um, or you may want to pursue labor market flexibility. Uh, that may create more jobs, although I think on things like minimum wages, there's really quite an ambiguous literature now. Certainly there's an association with labor market flexibility and squeezing the share of GNI to the poorest 40%. So labor market flexibility may create more jobs. It may also squeeze the share of income to the poorest. Uh, I'm going to leave that one and jump that for the moment. We can come back to the issues about what drives growth. So what, what can aid do about all these things, in, 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 given the, what you essentially got is a set of tensions and, and conflicts? A lot of, in some parts of the world, a very large number of people will be looking for work. I mean, there's, but I think, I mean, again, somewhat crudely, there's, there's three views you could take. Um, the first view is it, it's just not the business of aid to get involved in employment creation. I mean, actually, you, I think you could make a reasonable argument that aid already creates a lot of jobs. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's actually tried to sort of quantify that. I remember uh, a time when I, some years ago at DFID when there were a number of, uh, <clears throat> I think DFID now has a commitment to create one million jobs. Uh, but they, it, these are all in different countries and no one had aggregated the whole thing together and it came out at a million. So I think, I think it's clearly something that's on the, the donor radar. Um, I'm not sure about the sustainability of, of aid-led job creation as well. Um, I mean, maybe there's a stronger argument to focus on SMEs uh, or the climate for SMEs to try and uh, uh, stimulate uh, or make it easier for, for those kind of businesses. Um, you could also take the opposite line, again, with, with, with tensions and trade-offs. You could just shift a large substantial proportion of ODA over to um, production, ODA over to inf economic infrastructure. There was an interesting graph upstairs on the wider stall. I think um, combined um, production uh, and economic infrastructure only account for about a quarter of ODA. Uh, and, and social spending is, of course, rapidly rising up to, to, cover, to cover much of the rest. Um, clearly, there's, 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 there's trade-offs of that shift. Um, but that might provide a way of, of really boosting economic infrastructure in a way that perhaps is harder for, for countries when you have to, when the, when the payoff for some investments is actually 25 years in the future. Um, if you think of, sort of large infrastructure projects, roads and so forth, perhaps. Um, and actually, if you look at the evidence on aid, some of the strongest evidence aid is actually on the, the economic productive sectors. Or maybe there's something a bit more nuanced um, in terms of a, a reorientation to inclusive structural change. I mean, it strikes me that uh, certainly outside of the very poorest countries, 
a lot of, of countries that are, are, are doing okay are, are, are largely a collection of, 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 of well-off urban centers. So you could talk about middle-income countries, but most middle-income countries are two or three middle-income states and then a bunch of low-income countries around them. Um, so maybe there's something to be said for thinking about spatial inequality and the role aid could play in reconnecting uh, the kind of regions where a lot of the, the, the less educated workers or poorer workers might, uh, might, might dominate um, and connect those to the growth poles in, in countries. So to conclude, I think um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a set of relationships around structural change and inclusive growth. This, this simply returns to the five original arguments. Um, in a way, I mean, it's interesting, when, when you go to conferences, certainly in the UK, the people who would be at a conference on structural change, such as the International Growth Centre at LSE, would be a completely different crowd that would go to a poverty conference or conference on inclusive growth, I think. There wouldn't be a lot of overlap, which strikes me that there's a kind of, there's a literature more in very, uh, very economic journals that's, that's dealing with structural change. Uh, and that literature isn't, isn't intermingling or, or synthesizing with inclusive growth. And that may be because there's some real tensions there or, or people are looking at different things. But it strikes me that there may be a, a conceptually interesting area to pursue there that, that might be of use to policy too. Um, and and, and in, the, in the context of that, the, the, I mean, I showed you the regional curves. I mean, once you start going down to country level, you see how different things are even within regions. Um, but clearly there's a, there's a set of countries that have substantial and growing numbers of labor force entrants uh, and others that are declining, which, which means that the, what, what might be a appropriate policies or, or international cooperation in, in different countries could be quite different. Um, I think I made, made the point about structural change can be inclusive. They've suggested the focus on low educated workers <laughs> and some work we've been doing on Indonesia, thinking about this recently as well. Um, but there's, there's trade-offs in terms of the productivity uh, gains too to be made and how many jobs are created and what kinds of jobs are created. And I think underlying this is there's an argument I've been thinking about for a long time that, that maybe aid money can do things that national funds can't. And that's things with longer term horizons than the current, so typically countries have five year parliaments. Uh, and, and many pieces of infrastructure are very large upfront costs with, with returns in 20, 25 years. So maybe there's a role, a, di a different role for aid. And of course, infrastructure would be a very interesting uh, area to pursue, not only for its long run economic development benefits in terms of jobs and you know, expanding the production possibility frontier, but also in terms of the, the short term stimulus in terms of uh, in terms of jobs. Thank you.